I mentioned last week that it's easy for me to let my frustration sometimes quickly turn to anger. I have an especially hard time when things don't work the way I think they're supposed to. Like when I'm working on my car or fixing something around the house, I want things to work the way I think is right the first time. Like when I'm laying on my back in the driveway under the car trying to get the oil drain plug put back in or, or get the new oil filter lined up so I can tighten it up. If the threads don't line up perfectly the first time or it, get, it gets cross-threaded, I get angry quickly. Or things with technology can frustrate me really fast. I have an Apple iPhone, an iPad, and an Apple laptop, and they have all sorts of features that make them work together really easily. One feature is called AirDrop, and I can use it to immediately send a picture or a file from one of my Apple devices to another. And it's super handy, and I use it all the time, but every once in a while, it just won't work. My phone or my laptop or something won't show up as an option to send a file uh, no matter what I try. And when that happens, it usually means that I have to restart the device that isn't showing up. And that happens super rarely. 99% of the time, it works perfectly like it's supposed to. But whenever it does happen, my reaction is to get angry. And I'll be like, this stupid thing, come on, just work like you're supposed to. And I think my problem is the same problem as a lot of people in our world have today. A lot of us have an extreme lack of patience. We've come to expect everything we want, the way that we want it, exactly when we want it, which is usually right now. And it's easy for us to fall into that trap because our culture is set up to make us feel like we should be catered to and have all of our needs met. But the Bible has a lot to say about the value of patience. And like most things that are worth anything in this world, patience is something that we have to work for. It's something that has to be developed because it doesn't come naturally to us. A lot of times, the only way that we end up developing patience is through the painful process of being forced to be patient. Our family went to Disneyland a few years ago, and the newest ride there was this ride based on the movie Cars. And we had never been on the ride before, and it was awesome. It, it was super impressive how they created this ride and, and made everything feel so real. And we went on it several times over the course of the days that we were at the park. On the last day we were there, we had made this plan. Going on cars one last time was the way we planned to finish the evening. But just before we went to get in line, it started raining, and then the lightning and the thunder started. Since part of the ride is outside, they closed it because of the, the lightning in the area. So we were all disappointed and, well, we figured, well, we missed our chance. We'd been at Disneyland for several days, uh, all in a row, and we were all worn out. And Christy and I, my wife and I, figured that, well, it's fine because we'd already gone on the ride several times. But the kids wanted to wait, especially Ivy, our daughter. She was committed to waiting until they opened the ride back up or if closing time for the park came. And the rest of us tried to talk her out of it and we tried to make a case that, look, it's really not worth waiting for. But she was dedicated to the idea that we would get another chance to go on that ride. So we waited and waited and waited and it rained and rained and rained. And we kept going to check with the workers on the ride and they kept telling us that it was closed. But there was a slim chance, they said, that it could reopen if the weather cleared up. So we sat under this covered outdoor area in the cold and in the damp and we waited some more. I finally decided to use the time to go and do some shopping for souvenirs that I hadn't gotten to do. So, and when I got back after that, my family was still waiting and they looked miserable. They were sitting kind of slumped and defeated. We'd waited over two hours already and it was only about 30 minutes before the park closed. The window of opportunity was almost shut and we were exhausted. Finally, Isaiah, our son, went to check one last time to see if they were letting people onto the ride. And we didn't have much hope. But after a little bit, he came running back saying, it's open, it's open, come on, let's get on it. And so we almost didn't believe him at first. We thought he was making it up, but we jumped up and we gathered all of our stuff and we ran to get in line. But there was no line. Everyone else had given up. Nobody else was as patient as we were. So we walked right onto the ride. And in fact, we got to go on it three times in a row because there was nobody waiting to get on. We just went time after time. 
they kept sending us through over and over again. Ivy's patience and perseverance had paid off, and the rest of us had been forced to wait. And the waiting was miserable, but it ended up being worth it in the end because we got something better even than what we had hoped for. And since we last left Paul, he has been waiting. Claudius Lysias in Jerusalem didn't know what to do with him, so he had him sent to the Roman governor Felix in Caesarea. Felix didn't know what to do with him either, so he kept Paul in prison, but met with and talked with him regularly. But we see just how patient Paul has been when we read Acts 24, verse 27. It says, when two years had passed, Felix was succeeded by Portius Festus. But because Felix wanted to grant a favor to the Jews, he left Paul in prison. So thanks a lot there, Felix. He makes Paul flounder in prison for two years, and then he just leaves him there when he moves on. Paul is undoubtedly learning some patience here because he's being forced to be patient. But in the following few verses, we're told that this new governor, Festus, is a guy who likes to get things done. Three days after he gets there, after he comes to Caesarea, he travels up to Jerusalem to get to know the people of his province. And in Jerusalem, things haven't changed much in the past two years. The Jews immediately ask Festus to return Paul to Jerusalem to stand trial. And then they also still have this plan to ambush and murder Paul as he's being transferred back to Jerusalem. Festus spends 10 days in Jerusalem, but he tells him, hey, if you want, you know, you want to accuse Paul of something, you're going to have to come down to where he is. Then the day after he gets back to Caesarea, he convenes a court and he calls for Paul to be brought in. This guy does in like two weeks what Felix hadn't done in two years. But as the next part of Paul's story unfolds here, we're going to see something. Yes, he's been patient, but soon he's going to be wrapped up with some pretty rotten people. And we see that as followers of Jesus, we are not of this world, but we have to be in this world. And being in this world means having to deal with some pretty ugly things sometimes. Just like Paul, it meant we'll be under the authority of some people that we don't like. It means that a lot of people won't understand us. They won't listen to us. They won't accept us, won't know what to do with us. It means that some people will hate us. Some people will love us, some people will help us, and some people will do anything possible to stand in our way. But as followers of Jesus, we can be patient and know that it's not all up to us and that God will watch over us. Jesus prays for his disciples in John chapter 17. In verses 14 through 18, this is what Jesus asks for, for his followers. He says, I have given them your word, and the word has hate world has hated them, <clears throat> for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. We are citizens of this world, citizens of this country that we live in, but we are not of this world. And when Jesus says we are not of this world, it can be sort of confusing. This world is where we are. This world is where we are technically from. This world is really all that we physically know. Every part of our life and experience is impacted by this world. Now Jesus is talking about the world here, not in the sense of the planet Earth. He's talking about the world in a moral sense. But still, our lives are impacted on every level by the morality or lack of morality of this world. And while we talked last week about how we don't fight with the same weapons that the world does, we still have to navigate the systems of this world, just like Paul is going to have to do here. Paul has had conflict or disagreement with all sorts of people throughout his ministry, but the people he's dealing with now, they're a little more powerful. He's, he's faced the Sanhedrin the Jewish ruling council. He's faced a Roman commander in Claudius Lysias. Now he's faced two Roman governors, Felix and now Festus. But Paul's about to step into some pretty deep water here and what, when, in what we see next, and he's going to take a big step up in the hierarchy of the world at the time. The Jews have come to Caesarea and made all sorts of false accusations again about Paul. 
And they're shown to be false because they have no proof for any of them again. And so the Roman governor allows Paul to defend himself against these accusations again. So let's read Acts 25, 8 through 12. It says, Then Paul made his defense. I have done nothing wrong against the Jewish law or against the temple or against Caesar. Festus, wishing to do the Jews a favor, said to Paul, Are you willing to go up to Jerusalem and stand trial before me there on these charges? Paul answered, I am now standing before Caesar's court, where I ought to be tried. I have not done any wrong to the Jews. As for yourself, or as you yourself know very well, if, however, I am guilty of doing anything deserving death, I do not refuse to die. But if the charges brought against me by these Jews are not true, no one has the right to hand me over to them. I appeal to Caesar. After Festus had conferred with his counsel, he declared, you have appealed to Caesar, to Caesar you will go. Paul knows that if he agrees to go back to Jerusalem, it's a step backwards, and they'll find a way to kill him, for sure, if he does that. He knows that staying where he's at is not the goal, and it's not accomplishing anything, and so he does the only thing that he has left to do, in his power anyway. He appeals to Caesar. I think this catches everybody a little bit off guard. Festus is kind of like, ah, what? And he goes and talks with his advisors, but he agrees. And uh, now we could see this as Paul becoming, you know, impatient, trying to force his way to Rome. Or it could be that he sees the opportunity with a new governor who's actually moving quickly on his case here. I think we can see in Paul's situation here that we, we definitely don't want to run ahead of God. Paul's been patiently waiting in prison for two years. But we also see that we have to be ready to step up when the time comes. I think Paul saw the old governor, Felix, as an opportunity to share the gospel, to prepare himself when he finally did get to Rome. And I think he sees this new governor as a gift from God in the sense that he's going to get something done. Paul takes this opportunity to appeal to Caesar and to get himself moving toward Rome. And God often works the same way in our lives too. He, he might not give us a whole package wrapped up neatly and ready to go. Many times God opens a door for us or gives us a, a, a step forward towards something that he is going to open up for us as we go. Right now, both of our kids have their driving permits. And Isaiah, our son, only needs a few more hours of driving with us to be able to get his license. But Ivy, our daughter, is just starting out. And with each of them, we started their driving training by going to an empty parking lot. And we practiced starting and stopping and signaling and parking and a lot of other just driving basics. Then we had them venture out onto roads in the neighborhoods around our house where, you know, the speed limit is 25. And that's about the level where Ivy is at now. But Isaiah has graduated to the rural roads around town and then driving on highways and freeways and city traffic. And we eased them into this so that they would know how to handle the vehicle and the things happening around them on the road. We did it patiently, step by step, to prepare them for driving in the real world. If we had just handed them the keys and put them in the car and and let them go right out into busy traffic and on the highways and things, it would have been a disaster. And that's often how God works in our lives, too. If we were to see the full scope of the things that are ahead of us, if, if we were to be given responsibility for something that we had not been prepared for or grown into, it would be a recipe for disaster. Jesus says in Luke 16, 10, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much, and whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. Paul is on a journey. He's been faithful for two years, and God has been preparing him. Now God has provided him a chance to move forward, and he's taking it. So as you are being faithful where God has led you so far, Pay attention to what he's teaching you and be ready for a chance to take a next step that he might just put right in front of you. If you've been learning and, and growing with the help of others around you, look for a chance to use what you've learned to help other people grow. If you've noticed a need in the church or, or in some other area of your life, 
Look for a way to serve and to help and to step into that need. If you felt challenged in your obedience by reading Scripture or if you felt God tugging on your heart to change some area of your life, look for a chance to take another step in your faith and, and take your relationship with Jesus deeper. I believe that God will always be working to draw us closer to Him and deeper in our faith. So be watching for the doors He opens in your life to do just that. So Paul has taken this opening to appeal to Caesar, but he still has some hurdles to get over before he gets to Rome. Festus has agreed to send him to Rome, but Paul's still waiting. And the next event we see here in the book of Acts is that uh, the reigning king of Judea, Herod Agrippa, and his wife Bernice come to pay respect to the new Roman governor. And Agrippa is no real king. He's allowed to be in that position by the Romans, but Rome is really the one's pulling his strings. So this visit is mostly about Agrippa kind of making nice with his new boss here. So Festus tells Agrippa about all this stuff that's happened with Paul and the Jews and how Paul appealed to Caesar. And Agrippa says that he'd like to hear what Paul has to say in his defense. And so Festus agrees. But we see that there's a reason that he agrees. Acts 25, 23 through 27 says, the next day, Agrippa and Bernice came with great pomp and entered the audience room with the high-ranking military officers and the prominent men of the city. At the command of Festus, Paul was brought in. Festus said, King Agrippa and all who are present with us, you see this man. The whole Jewish community has petitioned me about him in Jerusalem and here in Caesarea, shouting that he ought not to live any longer. I found he had done nothing deserving of death. But because he made his appeal to, em to the emperor, I decided to send him to Rome. But I have nothing definite to write to his majesty about him. Therefore, I have brought him before all of you, and especially before you, King Agrippa, so that as a result of this investigation, I might have something to write. For I think it is unreasonable to send a prisoner on to Rome without specifying the charges against him. So here come all these people who consider themselves very important. It says that they came with great pomp. They made a grand entrance. They put on a show of how powerful and impressive and significant they were. And Festus would have been the most powerful of them all. But when we look at what he says, we see something important. When it's God's timing, he will accomplish his will. Just look at this situation. All these powerful players in Caesarea are here. They have, they, you know, they've all dressed up in their, their best, most impressive outfits. They're patting each other on the back for how powerful and intelligent and, and wonderful they are. And then Paul, this long-suffering, outcast prisoner, is brought in. And Festus, Rome's ultimate representative in this region, basically stands up and, and says, Agrippa, I'm hoping that you could help me figure something out. I've agreed to send this man to Rome, but I don't even have a reason for it. I don't know why. He's mystified as to why he's even agreed to send Paul to Rome. But Festus is asking the wrong person. King Agrippa or Bernice or none of these other impressive Roman elites were going to be able to answer the question. I think if Festus would have legitimately directly asked Paul, he would have said, you're sending me to Rome because it's God's will. God's promise and his plan were moving forward in his time. And Festus was a part of that, even though he didn't even know why or how he was participating. And God can and will still work in miraculous, mysterious ways to accomplish his will. But it's in his timing. And so we have to be patient like Paul was. For, for two years, he was patient and faithful while he was in prison. But then when things changed and God gave him an opportunity to move forward, Paul was ready and he took it. And even though Paul was still in chains, even though he was not free, God's timing had come and his plan was going to happen. So wherever we are, whatever role God has led us to, let's be faithful. And remember that we are in this world, but we are not of this world. We have a high calling wherever we find ourselves. But let's keep growing and paying attention to what God is teaching us so that when he gives us a next step forward, we're ready to follow. 
And let's keep trusting God, even when we can't see how things could possibly work out, because when it's his timing, God will work out his plan. And if we're ready, we can be a part of God's mysterious, miraculous, amazing work in this world. Let's pray. God, thank you for including us in your work. Thank you for giving us your word that we can dig into and, and uh, understand you more and we can grow and learn and we can be ready when you open a door in front of us or when you give us a, a chance for a step forward. And we want to be patient. We don't want to outrun you. We don't want to get out ahead of what you're doing, but we want to be ready. And we don't want to be of this world. We want to be in this world, but, but uh, doing things according to your will and according to your plan. And we ask that you'd help us to be faithful where we are, but ready to move forward when you call and that you would use us and have us ready for when it's your timing that you can use us to accomplish your will because we want to be a part of what you're doing and we want to be a part of, of the victory of your kingdom in this world. And we thank you for including us in that giving us a, a high calling wherever we find ourselves. And we ask that you would, uh, you would help us to be ready uh, to be faithful when, uh, when your time comes. Thank you for always being with us. Thank you for loving us so much. And thank you especially for the gift of Jesus. And we pray in his name. Amen.